When you think of a train, you'd normally expect the wheels and the track to be underneath the carriage, as that's how gravity works. That's how nearly every railway in the world works. You don't need me telling you that. But there are some trains in the world that defy this and run upside down. These railways look like there's something out of the future. They look as if they're floating in the sky. You can't see the tracks and the trains fly over the town they run in. Even though this seems so futuristic and modern, the first system of this type actually opened over a hundred years ago in Wuppertal in Germany. The idea was an invention of the 1820s by a British engineer named Henry Robinson Palmer. This prototype system was presented in 1821 in Woolwich Arsenal in London. It aimed to make it easier for horses to pull a train compared to a conventional railway as there was less friction from the trains on the rails. Back in Germany, the politician and industrial entrepreneur Friedrich Harcourt visited the prototype in Woolwich and loved the idea of this type of railway transporting coal to the steel mill that he owned. Totally not a corrupt politician at all. He returned to Germany and quickly presented the idea to his councillors, building a demonstration railway to try and gain the public's attention. Harcourt proposed that the suspension railway should run from the Ruhr region, where the coal mines were, to the Wupper Valley, where his factories and steel mills were, carrying coal and passengers. The local government would supposedly be funding this system, which is interesting to say the least, when it seems to be benefiting Harcourt's industry more than anything else. After the proposal, no progress was made in the construction of the railway, mainly due to protests from other factories in the region not owned by Harcourt. It wasn't until 1887 when the cities of Elberfeld and Barben, which lay on the River Wupper, formed an agreement to build an elevated railway along the river, known as a Hochbahn. In 1894, the engineer Eugen Langer was chosen for the system, and it got approval for construction in 1896. Construction began two years later, and the first test of the system occurred in 1900, with Emperor Wilhelm II of Germany on board. This rendition of the system was less corrupt, it was not designed to carry cargo. Instead, it was a full passenger system that connected towns and industries in the fast expanding Wupper Valley. The railway's opening in 1901 saw the section between Cluse and Zu Stadion opening, which focused on the Elberfeld area, now the city centre of Wuppertal. The line quickly expanded west of Vorwinkel and two years later saw the expansion to all the barmen. The support structure of the railway is made from steel girders. They look like spider legs holding up a floating train. The trains use a single rail with a claw-like bogey that reaches over the rail and the support structure. You can see how the wheels actually attach to the train in each station. Oh, and the stations are pretty similar to how they were in 1900. Just two wooden platforms and the steel suspended rails in between. Some of the stations even have the original architecture from the 1900s, so overall the system is pretty original. But there are two aspects of the system that are far from original. First, the trains. The current trains were introduced in 2015 and replaced the previous fleet of GTW 72 trains which had operated since the 1970s. These new trains look very futuristic, but they don't match the old-fashioned appearance that the rest of the infrastructure has. These new trains also bought new signalling for the system. This came in the form of ETCS, or European Train Control System, which replaced the colour light signalling previously used on the network. So why is Wuppertal, a relatively small city, the only place to have a 1900s Eugen Langer Hochbahn system? Well, it's pretty simple. Other places simply did not have the money or need to build an elevated railway through their city. Take Munich for example, it was cheaper to continue the expansion of the growing system of street running trams. Trams are tried and tested technology and they only require installing rails into the streets and construction of overhead wires, so a lot cheaper than building a hot barn, which would require steel and arguably more annoyingly, negotiation from the residents of the streets that were earmarked for the route of the line. Unlike Wuppertal, Munich is also not surrounded by steel mills meaning that transporting the large amount of steel needed for the system's construction would be difficult, especially when relying on 1900s technology. Also, Munich isn't located in a valley. The city grew out in all directions, rather than in the line of the valley. This is important as it is difficult to have junctions on a suspension railway, so the single line of Wuppertal with turning loops at each end works very well. But the big reason Wuppertal chose this type of transport is down to the main physical obstacle in the Wupper Valley, the river. 
The main benefit of a hog barn is so it can glide over a river, town or industries with no problem, making it very suitable for the densely populated valley that makes up Wuppertal. So that was the end of Ergen Langer's engineering marvel. It seemed that conventional railways were in fact more practical than suspended railways. But that wasn't the end of suspended railways forever. It was nearly a hundred years later and in the same area of Germany that Dortmund opened its own Hochbahn system in 1984, now called the H-Bahn. This installation was in the city's university. It first opened as a one kilometer line connecting the two campuses. The line costed 24 million German marks, equivalent to 12 million euros, making it a very expensive kilometer of transport. The Dortmund line was mainly a prototype to show that the modern H-Bahns could be feasible for modern day transport, and a pilot for the manufacturer, Siemens, to advertise the product, which they called a SIPM system. The network was expanded with a few branches around the university area, leaving the system we have today. The pilot system must have worked. Siemens managed to sell another H-Bahn system, this time in 2002, to Dusseldorf Airport, with a single line connecting to the train station, car parks and the free terminals of the airport. Both of these systems operate today and use a different track system to Wuppertal, which allows for easier switches to be made at junctions. So, have Hochbahns been a success? Well, not really. Nowhere else in Europe has decided to install one. Both renditions of the system are much more expensive and have less capacity than a regular railway, which is tried and tested technology as well making maintenance much easier and cheaper. But it doesn't mean that the three systems that I cover today aren't successful, especially Wuppertal Schreberbahn. This system has become so well known for its uniqueness, it's now become a bit of a tourist attraction. People come from far and wide to see and ride on Wuppertal's dangling railway. If you're ever in the northwest of Germany, Wuppertal is worth a visit to see the Schreberbahn. And if you're flying out of Dusseldorf Airport, you can't miss the modern H-Bahn. Thanks for watching today's video. If you want to know more about Germany's transport, I have made two other videos which you should check out as well.